Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm so happy that we are here this afternoon to celebrate the extraordinary work of Ronald Jackson. He has created two amazing bodies of work, um, the romanticization of the Black and Brown series, and also Profiles of Color 3, Fabric, Face, and Form. But before we begin the discussion about the work that's being featured here, I'm going to delve into Ronald's past, his life, <laughs> because that very much has informed um, what we're experiencing today in terms of the artwork. So Ronald, you were born in the Arkansas Delta, and you are the youngest of 11 children, and you grew up on a farm. Yeah. So tell us about that. Well, well first of all, thanks. I uh, appreciate you all coming to uh, share this, this, um, this creative experience and, and the things I've been doing for the past, past few months. But um, I, I had um, a, written an essay uh, that, that speaks, at, at least part of it speech, speaks to one of the paintings that's in the back. And just looking at it, I, I thought um, uh, an excerpt from it would, would be appropriate to, to uh, share. So, uh, you know, you don't mind just a short, short introduction. Not at all. All right. In the Mid-South State of Arkansas, 30 miles west of the Great Mississippi River, 11 miles south of the nearest town and down a dusty gravel rock road, 100 yards from a two-lane highway, stood a modest little house, nestled between a cow pasture, a large farm shed, two dusty cotton fields. This small and somewhat insignificant piece of land was the stage in which I was placed to begin my experiences in life. So um, I grew up in, in the, uh, the lower delta of, Mississippi, of Arkansas, um, uh, near the, the Mississippi. And as Mertis uh, shared, I was the 11th of I was the last of 11 kids, and between me and number 10 was, was uh, over seven years. So um, there, I wasn't supposed to happen, or, or maybe I was, but, but a lot of people were surprised whenever I came home. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, growing up from, from the fifth grade on, uh, I was the only kid in the house. You know, so most people think that I grew up with a lot of uh, siblings. I grew up um, with, with uh, three until they moved out. And then it was me and, and my uh, older um, my mother and father. My mother, my father was retired at the time. But um, yeah, it's, um, it, it, uh, there are a lot of things that, that had an impact um, uh, on me that, that I'm still uh, discovering today. I mean, I'm not sure we'll, we'll get into some of those a little more. Yeah, I'm very interested to know more about or learn more about your family's history uh, to the land. You told me uh, in a conversation we were having that your family owns 200 acres. And um, so tell us about that a little bit more and how that land was used to sustain your family. Okay, yeah. My, my uh, father and his brother, and I think in the er early uh, stages, uh, they may have had one of the other brothers, but, but I, I mostly knew of, of my father and my uncle um, um, farming. And uh, yeah, we, we had, uh, I think, a little over uh, 200 acres of, of land uh, eventually. But it, it was a, a, um, a time um, that, that my, my dad was, was not a high school graduate, you know, but he, he was one of the, the um, I say creative, but, but or gifted uh, men that, that I, I knew. He, he, um, he built the house that, that I grew up in from that I was born to I left. Um, uh, uh, and I recall him being able to take apart a combine and, and 
put it together. He, he was the first person that, that I've seen, that I've seen behind a sewing machine. Um, my mom used to hem my pants by hand, but, but my dad, he operated in the sewing machine. And so um, uh, to get back to, I, I guess, get back on track to, to your question, um, there were a number of experiences that my parents uh, went through shortly before I came on the scene. Um, uh, a small divert, but it's, it's going to, to the subject. Um, the, the locals in, in the area had, uh, it was during a time of segregation. And there were black schools, there were white schools, and, and during, during this time in, in the, the late 60s, segregation was, was no longer legal. But many of the, the schools were, were finding reasons to, to slow down the, the uh, de desegregation of the schools. And the, the, the school system that, that was near our, our home was, was one of those. This was, this was post Arkansas, uh, the Little Rock Nine. This was after, after all of that. But uh, in, in a little, little place, um, my siblings went to a, a small school in, in Turner, Arkansas, and the kids kept coming home uh, telling my fathers that, that man is getting really bad, that the, the sewage is, is uh, we have to clean up the sewage because um, it would every so often come up and, and the kids had to take turns uh, cleaning up. Um, so my dad decided uh, one day to go investigate it. And he discovered that there's a real problem, you know, and this was almost a daily occurrence. The sewage would, would back up. And my father went to the, the, the school board and, and tried to, to bring some resolution to, to the problem. And, and um, they, their response was that the, the kids didn't know how to use plumbing because they were they were accustomed to to outdoor and um, uh, facilities. Um, so my dad went and investigated a little more, and he saw that that there was a problem with the elevation of um, the the, the, what it, the the sewer. You know, didn't didn't run down. But anyway, it led to a point that my father said that if they won't do anything, and, and this, is, this is over time of trying to deal with it, that he was going to take his kids out of the school. Um, which led to the, the um, Turner School or Marble School uh, boycott. Um, a, a small black school that, that just had, a, um, I think maybe a couple hundred of, uh, uh, kids, a few hundred kids. Um, the next Monday, there was only 35 kids showed up. So, so that started. Um, uh, there's, there's a uh, if you Google Earlis E A R L E S Jackson versus Marble School um, Board of Education. There's a um, uh, court case that's, that comes up in Google and. And there, there were some things that, that they experienced. The, the disadvantage of being in that system is that, that um, they would get um, school books and materials from handed down from, from white schools. And they would have to navigate through, through uh, torn out pages um, um, and also uh, racial comments and, and, and drawings and things that they had to navigate to through to to just just get an ed education. So a, a lot of these things um, uh, led to my father and my mother um, becoming labeled as as troublemakers in the community. My, my father, um, um, being a farmer, one of the things that that farmers are, are required or, or relied upon it, it is uh, two things that that the, the, the locals or, or the white population control, and that was banks for, for loans. That was something that they were required to do every year. Then there's, there's the seed and supply. They had to, to uh, go and, 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 and 
work with them uh, to, to operate their farms. And, and my, my, my father and his brother um, experienced a, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, retaliation from, from um, some of the things that they were doing. Outside of just the, the school boy, boycott, but, but because of the success of, of that, they organized um, a boycott of bus stations uh, near town. And, and there, was, there was one point that, that they were organizing a march in the local, the local town, uh, less than 2,000 people at the time. Um, and it had, get, it had gotten out. I'm, I'm sorry, this, this is... <laughs> It had gotten out that, that they was organizing this march. They was, they was going to, to uh, march on um, um, segregating schools and were getting, getting um, um, you know, uh, proper education um, you know, opportunities. And someone came to my mother and told her that they had come from, from town. And, and this was prior to the, the day of the march, and that they had trucks of, of people, um, full of trucks of people with, with rifles, and, 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 and likely had come from, from uh, neighboring counties that were there waiting to deter the, the march. And my mom, who, who was pretty fearless, uh, as, as she talked for, for regarding some of the other things, decided that they were going to call off the march. Uh, they, they didn't, they didn't want to take it to, to that level. And just to end this, this part, I just want to say that, that part of the, the retaliation that, that my parents received was um, driving from the nearest town um, on the, the long road um, to our home, our property, uh, my mother was overtaken by a, a truck of two guys in it who, um, passenger, um, stuck his hand out of the, the, the window and pointed a gun at my mother driving side by side on a two-lane road. Harassing her, yes, but, but he pulled the trigger as they pulled off and, and fired at her. My, my father's... Um, Heavy farm equipment had been sabotaged by, by someone um, putting sugar in the tanks. And he had to take, take the, he and his brother taking the, 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 uh, the combine and equipment apart to, to restore it. My, my sister re recalls uh, going out on the porch one night and discovering that there was a fire under the shed. My father had to get up and go get a tractor, pull his equipment out of the shed. And I remember that, that, um, that piece of rusted old um, tractor where I grew up that was, that was still in the field that was, was burn, burned up. Um, uh, my mother also recalled the time where, where coming, coming outside and discovered that there was a cross, cross that had been burned in our yard. And the thing that she said that, you know, I, I thought when, when I um, am reminded of a cross being burned, I thought it was something that they would raise up, but they had burned the cross in the grass. Uh, so those, those are just a few of the, the retaliations that, that, um, that just because my, my father had, had a number of kids and he wanted, wanted them to be able to learn without the, the without having to deal with, with cleaning up sewage in your school. You know, and it's, and, and there, there's one, one other thing, if we get to it at a time, regarding the, uh, St. Charles, I, I will um, I refer to that later. Well, I'll definitely ask you about that. So after graduating from high school, you left Arkansas and went to California to, uh, you were enrolled in an architectural design school a program at Mission Viejo College. 
So, but you only took one class, and then you left. So, what happened? Uh, um, uh, front row, right there to the left. <laughs> 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 I, I, I met, met my wife, <laughs> but, but um, I, I, realized, I realized that, that um, uh, architecture, that, that was something that, that I thought that it, it was the answer uh, to my um, the, the creative talent or whatever that, that I had. It, it was, and I, I'd never gone to a museum. Um, I, I was, 17, 17 years old, um, never um, seen a professional uh, artist, so I, I knew nothing about pursuing that. Uh, so um, uh, I chose to, to enter that program, but that, that quickly um, uh, was diverted to, to pursue uh, something else. And then you went on to join the military, right. traveling military, and then um, when did you, what year did you end up here after your military service? When did you come to this area? After my military service? Well, I, I was in, um, I, I, let me see, I did 21 years, 21 years, four months, seven days, and, and you know, I, I can't remember the minutes. I, I'm, always, <laughs> I'm always forgetting that, but, but. My, my whole career, um, which a number of years overseas, all of my stateside assignments was in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So um, from, from 93 to 96, I was at the Pentagon and, and was at Fort, Fort Belvoir a, no, a number of times and then at, at uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland. So um, I came back from, from did two tours in Iraq and I came while I was in Germany, and then I came here and have been uh, in the Virginia area um, to Fort Belvoir since 2007. So in 2010, you had a life-changing experience. You, uh, your work was selected for a regional exhibition held at the Clav Colson Gallery, if I'm pronouncing that right. And yet the show was uh, juried by Jennifer Clav Colvin, Colson, Colson, is that it? Um, Jennifer, uh, yes, yeah, her, her husband is, 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 is the name of her husband and, and her husband's oh, name yeah. um, And you received the Best of Show award. And um, that kind of marked the beginning of your, you say, your public recognition of your art. And, well, how were you personally impacted by that? Well, um, that, I, I, I would say that um, I had, had a greater experience uh, nine years pre previous, previous that led me to seriously pursue art. Um, you know, pursue my painting and, and art. And from that point, I began trying to develop um, um, my, my skills because I didn't have the opportunity to uh, uh, go to art school or pursue that because I was in the middle of, of a military career. So I, I worked uh, for, for nine years uh, just, just trying to develop develop my, my drawing, my rendering, my painting. And um, 2010 was the first time I publicly exhibited anything. And to, to receive the best, best of show in, in that, um, that exhibit, you know, it was like, I receive best of show and I get a monetary award and I get to keep the painting? Like wow, I, I like this. So, so um, it it was at least to say encouraging, you know, um, um, relatively unknown, new to to the art world, and I I was able to to have a my first solo show the following year. Mm -hmm. So let's look at some of the work now. Let's start with the romanticization of the Black and Brown series and. Let's talk a little bit about this piece, The Couple in Garden with Horse, and the inspiration for it. 
This is a part of your narrative of painting series. Yeah, I've, I've done uh, a lot of portraiture, portrait painting, um, but, but I, I prefer not to be uh, considered or uh, focus on, on portraits. Uh, it will always be a, uh, something that I do, but uh, narrative works, uh, being able to, to tell a story or, or explore ideas through my art is a preferred way of, of me using, using my art. Um, during this series, uh, the romanticization of black and brown, I don't even know if that's a word, romanticization, it's hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> you titled it. <laughs> I, I titled it. But I, I was, was doing a time where, where I was studying and, and reading and, and listening to, watching documentaries on, on different uh, art movements and, and was listening uh, um, about the romanticism, the romanticism, um, and discovering, you know, the, the passion behind what that meant, what that period meant, and the ideas that, that they they tried to communicate uh, through that movement, and and even to the point that that they tried to express certain ideas to the point that the the accuracy or the factuality of, of what they were presenting was secondary, or, or the truth was secondary to, to the idea. So with, with this series, I, I started thinking about um, what would it have been like if, if there were um, um, black and brown peoples throughout the, the, the country, other countries, and, and also during that time I was reading the book, um, um, uh, what is it, Che Guevara, a revolutionary. And, and I start to discover uh, uh, in, the, in the background of the story, not, not the, the, the forefront of the story, the different, um, um, the different black and brown people of, of South America and, and Central America and the, the, the things that, that they were experiencing that was somewhat parallel to what, what uh, uh, black people experienced in America, but in other ways distinctively different. So, so I, I was taking these um, pieces, not just referencing African Americans, but but um, black and brown people of the African uh, uh, diaspora, you know. So I was coming up with the concept of what if my fathers or, or their fathers were able to to um, prosper, to to have dreams and, and, and prosper, to 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 get land and pursue things without the stressors or without the, 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 um, um, the issues that, that historically they've had to, to deal with. Uh, one of the things I, I, I heard uh, as we were listening to some, some uh, songs on the way up here, someone said that, that um, um, when you're surviving, it's hard to dream because you're, 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 you're you're, you're not given that, that, that opportunity or, or big survival is, is, is forefront. And that has been the, the, the idea or the existence for a lot of our, um, um, our forefathers, our, uh, our, our heritage is, has been surviving. But what if or how would it look in history if black and brown people uh, uh, own, you know, own things. You know, I, um, I was listening, I was going to, um, so online, planning uh, a trip to, to Art, Art Basel. I was looking at hotels and I was checking out this one hotel, this, this guy, he was telling about the history of his family owning this, this uh, hotel. It's, it's been in their family for, for years, and it's, and it's come down to him. He's the, the manager. And I was wondering, man, 
what if uh, um, my heritage had, had or my, my great grandfathers had the opportunity to, to own property of uh, businesses and that, that uh, prosperity uh, I was able to experience today. You know? Thank you. And, and a lot of things that, that they, they did instill that, that, that we're blessed to have, the, the values, the, 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 the hard work and things like that. And, The, the integrity of, of who we are. Uh, those are some of the things that, that they've given to us. So I'm just look um, <clears throat> at a couple more paintings that are also in the series. This piece is currently on loan um, through the Arts and Embassies program through the uh, U.S. Department of State, and it's in Ethiopia. Uh, this is a couple in gar garden with rooster. And this is in, featured in this exhibition, self-portrait as a horse. So um, we have two horse paintings, both of them in the PowerPoint presentation. But so there's been uh, a lot of questions about what the floating objects are that surround the horse, and that's just under the face of the horse, uh, and that one just floating just above the back of the horse. So. Tell us about this painting, okay. please. All right, and, and I, I must add, if it's okay, that, that these were the images prior to the yes. completion. So there, you may see a, a couple items that are not in the, the finish. And, and also, you, you see a line uh, from the, the object uh, beneath the horse. So to, um, I wasn't aware that those objects that I, I placed around the horse were going to be a subject of, of confusion uh, because it, it was fully aware. I was fully aware of what, what they were, and I thought everyone else was. But um, they, they are a mylar balloons. Uh, I initially uh, um, I got some balloons that, that were fully inflated, and I was going to paint them, but it was like painting mirrors. So uh, it would have been painting the inside of my studio. So they stayed in my studio just hanging and I had left the balloons. I was going to explore some other idea. And after weeks, the balloons start to crumble and they start to, to um, come from the ceiling and, and fall down. It's like, wow, you know. But the idea around both of the horses, the balloons is, are, are celebrating the horse. It's, it's some type of, of celebration. Just like the flowers, I, I use a lot. You know, flowers thrown, you know, around a, a, a Kentucky Derby horse or whatever. The the other one has um, origami um, paper paper uh, birds, you know. And there's also a, a, a mango underneath the the, the horse that, that didn't make the cut. <laughs> you got to take it out. Um, but uh, this is also um, um, using an use idea that, that I, I like to use of a sub substitution, uh, sub substituting um, objects to, to imply the, the, the same message. Uh, I grew up, I, I had, uh, didn't have horses, we had cows, but there would be birds that, that would fly around, sit on top of the cows. But in the same idea here around the horses, birds can flock around horses, you know, but instead of presenting them in that way, I chose, chose to, to use um, paper birds um, to, to, to add a, a different a visual experience and, and also su suggest a, a, another way of, of, of celebrating the, 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 the horse but also adding to the, the, the mystic element that, that I strive to, to uh, create a, a magic realism aspect to my work. But you also, now the title of both of these is Self-Portrait as a Horse. So you're using the horse as a metaphor for yourself. So talk about that relationship there. Yeah, um, the horses, um, 
as I, I, I started looking at them and considering adding them to, to my work, I started seeing a parallel. I, I have a military background. I um, started looking at um, horses are, are uh, animals that have served since, since civilization. They have served the, the, uh, those that are in power, the, the wealthy. They, they are looked at as a object of, of affluence, you know, people that that are, are wealthy, you know, can, uh, they're a prized possession. And I started seeing a, a lot of parallels how, how um, the strength, the, the beauty of, of horses uh, have, have been, been paraded um, uh, throughout, throughout um, you know, the, the centuries. Um, even, even in, in Let's, let's see. They, they, they're used, they've been used a lot, you know, for labor, you know, and paralleling that aspect to, to uh, slavery, you know, using the, the, the strength of, of, of um, the African slaves that, that came. And one of the things that, that I, I would notice is that during, during the time of slavery, you know, not, there were not too many of, American population that, that owned slaves, you know, it was the, the ones that were of affluent, you know, wealth, power, you know, and, and they they took advantage of that to create a, a economic system, you know, that everybody uh, benefited from that were not slaves. But uh, one thing I, I would add, you know, um, if, if I uh, reference myself as a dog, that that would be that would have um, negative connotations, I, I would think. But a a dog is is valued for its companionship and and loyal friendship, you know, uh, to its owner, you know, um, and doesn't give bring the value as as a horse horse does. So. Um, I, I thought that was an interesting um, uh, parallel just recently thinking about that. But the horses are, are in a way, a parallel of, of black and brown people. That's why I chose the, the black and brown horse. So the last piece here is part of the series, which is one that you recently completed. And it's one of two textile pieces that you're featuring. Um, tell us about the about this piece. I love the title of it, and we're just going to talk about the titles um, because they're very relevant to who you are. Um, your personal life experiences are, are reflected in the titles of the, the work. So this one is uh, titled "Remembering the Sounds of Home." Can you talk to us about this piece? Yes, this this piece here is is the one that, that I, I wanted to uh, bring out my, my essay, and I have a short paragraph that that speaks to to this this piece here. And the various species of playfully singing birds provided the atmosphere with a beautiful melodic and rhythmic presence as they proudly entertained each other from within the bushes, nestled among the surrounding trees. They even seemed not to mind the sudden bursts of, of loud clatter as a cranking farm vehicle would echo from under the large equipment shed. Nor did the occasional off-key belch of a mooing cow ever disrupt their harmonious perfection. To add to this odd symphonic experience, a distant low pitch hum would slowly emerge as a roaring tractor trailer truck, and then it would fade into the distance again as it passed on the nearby highway. So that, that are some of the sounds that, that I, I remember as a childhood, you know, um, outside of the, at nighttime, the, the, the insects that that are so loud you would, you would think they were much bigger than, than they are. 
But um, this piece not only reference um, my my childhood, but I, I look at it also as as a person um, that could be considering the, the, the motherland uh, where where the ancestors came from. Looking back to that home as, as well. So. Um, Move on. Um, so I, we wanted to share images of profiles of color too, um, which these works are not featured in the show, but we wanted to show the progression of what sort of gave birth to and has influenced what we're experiencing today. So Ronald, is there any particular piece you want to talk about or just wanted to have the images shared? No, those, this, these are the, the first iteration of, of the Profile of Color, color uh, series, and, and it, it was something I, I just fell into um, using, using uh, exploring collage. I, I'd never, never um, done collage before, and, and I was preparing for a, a solo show in, in Richmond, and I was coming close to to um, need to have the works done, and I was behind schedule, <laughs> and, and this became a, a quick quicker way for me to to uh, bring the pieces together, and I I really had fun with that. But and during the show, the the works got so much attention, uh, they they overshadowed my my paintings that I I had worked for several weeks on. <laughs> And, and it, it kind of annoyed me, you know, everyone just congregating to these. So, so if this has, has become a, a, a part of, of my, my creative um, pursuit of, of work, you know, incorporating uh, fabric, paper, and, and collage. So let, now let's explore the materiality and the tonality of your work. Um, you know, here in the Floral Mask series, you are reimagining uh, African American portraiture. And um, why did you choose to paint the faces with floral masks? All right. Well, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, as I, I shared earlier, I, I don't particularly, I'm, I'm really not as, as moved by simple portraits. You know, there's, there's, there's something uh, additional I, I, I like to bring to, to uh, my, my portrait works. I think portraits can be really strong, especially if, if you just uh, consider the, the, the person that, that you're looking at, uh, consider their, their, their experiences, their, um, uh, who they are, you know, the value that, that you attribute to them. Um, regarding, regarding the mass, um, mass has, has um, two, two roles, they're two folds. Uh, they can be used to, to conceal as, as a, a bank robber would put on a mask to conceal his identity. Um, they're also used to project. Uh, as a, a little kid would put on a, a Spider-Man or Batman mask to project himself as being someone great or, or, or project uh, uh, a person to see him differently. So um, creating these portraits, uh, I, I, I want to, to create a, a a dialogue uh, with the viewer that, that's looking at them, even if it's an a inward um, a dialogue with, with oneself, uh, pondering the experiences or, or, or who the people are. And, and one of the things that, that these paintings are a little more about the, the projection, um, not so much about concealing who they are, but what what ideas or, or what are they projecting? And and without getting 
specific, just, just um, we, we can all have our, our own uh, um, uh, opinions or, or, or share what, what we uh, uh, get from an image, but uh, basically what I am doing with the, the floral mask is projecting uh, uh, an image that is welcoming, inviting, uh, um, non-confrontational or non-threatening. Um, I've done some some uh, other paintings that that I'm, I'm painting young black men that have objects in their hands, and the objects in their hands is is a branch with flowers on it or or with leaves, as opposed to something that could be considered threatening. So that the, the idea of having masks. Is, is for you to consider um, um, the person behind the mask as welcoming as the, the image on the mask. Um, I, I, have, I know of no person that has a negative disposition towards flowers. I've, I've, I've never heard anyone say, uh, um, you know, who in the, who in the blank brought these thorn flowers, or left these flowers, you know, no matter who you are, you know, I'm, I've never known anyone have a, ne a negative uh, disposition towards flowers. So, so it's, it's a, a, a um, uh, invitation for you to see a, a, a person with, with a non-threatening, a, a warm, or a, a, a welcoming uh, disposition. Does that come as a, a response to uh, the political, social attack on African-American men and women, innocent individuals where our black and brown bodies are seen as a threat? Um, does it stem from that or not? I'm, I'm posing the question. Yes, yes, not specifically. That that is that's a large large part of it, especially uh, uh, recently within the last few years. But but more in a subtle way, um, uh, especially with with, with uh, these these uh, portraits here. Um, what one of the things that that is incredible, I, I still find incredible today is is the the um, um, what what was the, the study the the, the doll. The, oh. The white and black dolls. Yeah, yeah. What, what is yes. that study called? The, the doll study? Um, um, well, well, it basically goes like this. Yes. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. They, they yeah. had the, the black and brown doll, yeah, they, white and black and white yeah, doll they, in the classroom and asked the black children which they preferred and they chose the white doll. And I can't remember right, the name of the right. test. So, so there's, there's a, a, a black doll and, and a, a white doll. And these little kids that, that are that are too young to to uh, develop such such a, a view, um, and the study I think started in, in possibly the forties um, or the fifties, forties, fifties, and there have been several studies that that has um, uh, did the experiment over. I think it's just called the doll test. The doll test. That's that's basically it, and and the. The little black kids were asked questions like, "Which doll, which doll is beautiful?" They point to the white one. Which which doll is 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 uh, nice, or, you know? And every every positive uh, question was was directed to the, the kids, directed to the, the white doll. Every negative question, the kids would point to the black doll. Um, and the, the, the same thing would, would happen in reverse to, to the, uh, the white kids, little white kids, and they would come to the same conclusion. And that, that shows the, the power of, of, of the influence a society has. Um, um, I, I grew up in a town that, that had a, a, a strong um, a negative racial history, but and, and I would say I, I, I grew up around uh, many uh, racial
basis, um, um, people, friends, and the odd thing about it, uh, uh, growing up in, in that environment, is that some of them were, were some of the nicest people, if, if you can believe that. Some of them, you know, were, were um, incredibly uh, uh, warm at, at times, and, and you wouldn't uh, necessarily realize um, the situation, especially us growing, growing up there. And, and the issue is, as long as, as you are in your place and, and, you know, we stay in our places, we're fine and we can get along. And, and that, that is, that is the, 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 the unfortunate, unfortunate um, uh, reality that I grew up, grew up in, not realizing the, 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 the racist situation that, that I uh, was surrounded. And even, even leaving home at 19, 1988, and I'm sure at this day, the, the one, um, um, the one swimming pool in our, in our town, you know, blacks weren't allowed to, to uh, go there. And, and, I, and I'm sure it's the same now. So did you want to talk about the title of this one, How Grandma Sees Me? Yeah, that, that continues the, the, the idea of uh, projecting uh, through the mask um, who the person is or, or how they, they would like to be seen. And in this particular piece, it's titled, you know, basically this is how my grandmother sees me. You know, she's, she, um, uh, and, and also um, uh, suggesting to others that, that maybe could you see me the same way as my grandmother sees me? Um, this one is titled A Prayer for St. Charles, and you said that this had a special meaning. Sure. Right. Um, a Prayer for St. Charles is, is um, uh, referencing the, an area just, just south of where I grew up with, within a, a few mile, miles. Um, uh, it has some, some, some history um, back in, in 1904. It's, it's probably most known for, for the, the uh, St. Charles lynchings. And I'm not going to go into the story of that. You can Google uh, St. Charles lynching. But my father, um, traveling with a friend of his, um, uh, going through, through that area, there was the, the water was, was high, and it had flooded the road. My father tried to, to um, go past, go through it. And the water took my father and his friend into the, you know, the high waters. And, and um, they were not able to, to uh, recover the vehicle. My father's friend could not swim. He ended up drowning. My father was uh, fortunate. He, he was he was able to uh, get back to 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 the land, and because my my father was was labeled um, as a troublemaker, um, he was he was taken taken to jail um, um, from this incident. He only, he only stayed one night in jail, and this, this, was, this was in the, the fall, and, and it was, it was rather, rather cool, it wasn't warm uh, as it is now, and he was required to spend the night in jail in his wet clothes then, without any replacement. And, and this, this is something that, you know, I've, I've grown up never never experienced hearing my father say anything negative to the table. You know, I can't say that about my mom. <laughs> she, 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 would, she, would, she would say, no, no. Her, her, curse, her curse word was, was ugly. You know, <laughs> you know, with your ugly self. And that was the extent of her talking about me. But, but that, that was the experience of, you know, my, my father with uh, St. Charles and, the St. Charles 
uh, lynchings. So I find this piece rather striking because the expression is so different from the others. And I wonder if you could tell us why you chose to create this painting with this grimace, and also a little bit about the title, A Bale of Bitter Songs. Okay. Um, all, all, of, all of the mask uh, pieces were, were um, I painted out of, out of my, my head, um, the, the, the portraits, except this one. Uh, this one is, is of, of my niece. Um, and, and she is a, um, she's a talented singer, um, uh, so, so I, I started thinking about songs uh, with this one. But, but the, the other ones are, are they're, they're pretty much um, hiding any outward emotion. And, and I, I, I like to present portraits in, in that fashion that, that it's, it's more of an intimate uh, setting when, when you look at a person with, without much uh, emotion expressed. I, I like to find, uh, create a, a, a picture of a person that, that you would find maybe in their personal space. And I, and I would think that, that when we're in the room by ourselves or, or alone, we're not, we're not giving a smile or, or grinning. That's part of, of interacting socially with other people when we smile and, and we grin. But when we're in an intimate place, there's not much uh, outward expression going on. But usually there is internal uh, expression. So that's, that's the things that, that these pieces, uh, I'm inviting people to ponder who they are, what's, what they're experiencing inside. But this, this painting or this, this uh, piece here, there is a, a, a little expression of, of something inside being, being uh, um, brought out. Um, you know, even if it's, it's just a, a little, it could be an experience or, or a way they're, they're feeling today. But the same message remains the same. Despite that, can you, can you still um, uh, see me as, as welcoming or, or um, you know, non-confrontive? Non you know? But... So the, the, the bitter, the bitter uh, song speaks to the, the experiences that may cause her to, to have that, that smile on her face as she may be recalling something. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to uh, focus on this piece for a bit because the way in which it's created is far different from that of the mask uh, paintings. And so again, in delving into the material use, the use of materials to create the work, the layering and collage and assemblage that techniques that you've used, and um, also the tonality, you know, the flesh tones that are so rich and luscious in, in each one of the pieces. So just chose this one because I thought she was a great example of all of that. Well, well, this this continued the the, the earlier um, uh, practice of, 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 of me exploring uh, collage, and and I, I think the way I, I do the collage is it's it could be considered a pseudo, not not really the way most most collage artists uh, work, but. But for this and, and, and the other, other pieces like that, it, it basically started with, with me um, um, painting a, a person and, and doing a, a on canvas and doing a, a cutout of, of the, the, um, the portrait of the person. And the particular thing that, that was able to, to allow me to produce the works in the, the, the first series uh, is that I can take that cl cut out and place it against a, a uh, material, a paper, and get an immediate response of how it would work. When I'm painting, um, 
it would require me to, to take colors, apply, and a lot of times those colors are not uh, giving me the response that I want. And to take that color away and bring other, it was more of a, um, um, a process of, of changing your direction. But, but taking a, a cutout of a painting and placing it on fabric, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. Oh, I like that. Let me, let me start with that. So it, it, it began a, 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 a way of, of incorporating an environment and, and, and seeing how the, the different colors would, would, would change the, the feeling of the, the, the piece. So now this beautiful woman here, is she from your imagination or is this someone that you know? Uh, yes, yes, she's definitely from imagination. I, I, I start out with, with a sketch and, and um, but the, the people that, that I create, create I'm, I'm familiar, I, I use familiar features that, that I've seen or, or taken note of. Um, and likely through from, from my childhood and, and from, from growing up um, because a lot of times they, they turn out looking familiar. So just another example of uh, this assemblage. Uh, the face was created separate or is this face painted on the wood? Yes, it's, it's, it's separate. Uh, uh, these pieces, there, there are three that are 16 by 20. This was created, uh, this wall on, on paper, um, um, watercolor paper that, that was prepared to uh, handle oil paint. And, and again, I, I cut out the, the, um, the portrait after I painted it and start exploring it with the, the background. So now we're going to look at the larger portraits. And we wanted to show, uh, fortunately you documented various uh, stages in your creative process. The title of this one uh, is No One Knows Elaine. So this is, is this a charcoal sketch? Yes. Of her? All right. And then, did you want to make a comment? Uh, just, just the, the comment that Elaine is, is a, a, another area near where I grew up, and and the significant history of, of that, you know, is is um, the Elaine massacres. Um, that's something that again you, you can look up um, uh, Wikipedia. Um, there is a a um, what is it? Newsweek, I, I think, or it may have been Time magazine that, that did a, a feature on the Elaine Massacre in the Arkansas Delta. My mother was featured in, in that article. But that that occurred um, um, it was during a time af after World, uh, World War One, where a, a lot of blacks had come back from from uh, serving in, in the war. And so here you are working through the tonality, the hair, the face. Let's talk a little bit about the eyes and how um, an experience, a conversation you had with a special person influenced um, the way the eyes were rendered in the paintings. Yeah, you know, I, I had, had the, the opportunity to, to meet someone uh, um, a couple of years back that was asking me questions about my work and and um, the question was was basically you know why why are they so sad you know and I thought that okay it wasn't my intent to make them sad it's and this but, is a previous body of work yeah I pre just wanted to clarify. yeah previous body of work and and the the person just you know um, just was pulling from me uh, about give her uh, some some story uh, about about why their their experiences and, and, and what what it's about and, and she made a, a, a comment that 
that I understand, but you know, there's 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 not not much life in their eyes, you know. So so I I, I um, talked to Mertis about that, and I was like, it's like. Wow, what are your clients really got into me about how I was rendering uh, some of the work? You know, I'm not going to say who it was, but... Well, we can share. It was uh, the actress C.C.H. Ponder, who's in, like, NCIS, New Orleans, lots of movies. She actually has acquired a um, couple in Garden. Yes. Uh, with us. Yes, in the back. A couple in Garden with horse. Um, and so... We were at Basel a couple of years ago, and Ronald didn't know who she was, and he's like, who is that woman? <laughs> I was like, oh my god, you just said that was a tour, did you? <laughs> so I have reminded her recently with the acquisition, and she stayed in touch with me. She's been following his work, and immediately upon sending uh, images of uh, paintings that were in this, uh, uh, exhibition, she acquired that one, and I told her in an email that that conversation with Ronald has stayed with him and has greatly influenced the way in which he paints yeah. the eyes today. So, so I, I did give a, a little more attention to, to the eyes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> and so here, I wanted you to talk about, um, you know, the fabric that surrounds the uh, the portraits and sort of the process of s selecting that because it's all a part of what uh, is reflected in the work. Okay. Yeah, I, I think out of the uh, 22 pieces that are um, exhibited here, um, besides the, the four in the back, eight, 18 pieces, uh, I started working on them uh, towards the end of February. And and I spent probably very little time in, in the painting process. The, the majority of, of the time spent was trying to find fabric. And, and I, I, I went to, to different, started at, at Michael's and, 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 and Joanne Fabrics. Then I moved to, to uh, the, the DC Design Center and, and I started purchasing uh, from a person there, and and I explored as as far as as Pennsylvania, uh, Richmond. I, I found uh, uh, some good fabric that I worked with there, and and the the process of selecting the fabric um, was a little more than I expected it, it would be, because I would take a a small swatch like that and pair it against the painting, and it would speak one thing, but when I buy two yards and take it and cut it out and put it on the piece, it would speak differently. And unfortunately, I, I wasted a, a, lot of, a lot of fabric that, that um, didn't get used. And this piece was initially gonna have a blue uh, background, but it didn't work, and I had to to um, had to change. So very little of the, the time was was in the painting process. It was mostly the the, uh, the search for the right fabric. So I just wanted to show like the various fabrics, and then there's a sewing machine in this one. So I wanted you to share the story of taking the sewing class. Yeah. I, I um, a few years back, I, I've been talking, I've been sharing with my wife that, you know, honey, I, I have some, some ideas that you're going to have to teach me how, how to uh, use the sewing machine. And my, my wife would, would always smile and, and, <laughs> and basically ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and probably a, a number of years, you know, I asked because... Because I, I felt that there's something that, that I could I could do with with just being able to to have that skill set. And just last year, um, when was it? Uh, before my birthday, uh, this time last year, 
I came to my wife again. But this time I said, guess what? Uh, and she said, what? I said, I have signed up for a beginner sewing class. <laughs> so so I, I, I went to um, um, one, one of the stores, um, uh, fabric stores, that offer classes. And I, I took my wife's sewing machine and, and I was in the class with about um, uh, at least four other women being taught by a woman, and I think there was a couple of little girls. Um, and hey, I, I was I was in there with them, you know, ready ready to go. And I'm sure every every person in there um, was curious, but they wouldn't they wouldn't ask. And, and I knew that, so I, I didn't I didn't reward their curiosity by telling them. Yeah. So um, after. You know, halfway through, we're almost done. The instructor, um, you know, worked around like so. Um, what led you to to um, wanting to to uh, do this? And I, I went on to tell her I'm, I'm an artist, and um, there's some things that I, I want to explore that would require me to to um, uh, know how to use a sewing machine. So that that was the start of it. Uh, uh, July the 8th last last year. And so I wanted you to share that story because one, I love it. And uh, secondly, so that people really understand the extent by which you, you know, honed your skills and took this process very seriously, that you made not only the people, call them the Jackson family, but also the clothing that they're adorned with. So I thought it was very important for them to know that your wife didn't do that, that you are actually responsible for clothing them. <laughs> so I just wanted to show uh, the large portraits and, you know, again, these various iterations of completion. And this are, these, of course, are before you actually uh, surrounded the bases with the fabrics. And so, Helena and Luke, um, talk to us about this piece and about the title. Okay. Uh, this, this piece was, let me see, I think she was, I think she was either the second or third uh, that I sketched. But um, uh, Helena in blue, I call her Helena in blue because because I, I, I was born in, in Helena, Arkansas. Uh, my, my, my son right here, he was also born in Helena, Arkansas. Hel Helena is, is um, uh, the home of, of Johnny Cash. Um, it is right within, uh, uh, it's right at, um, near Tunica, Mississippi, you know, right on the Mississippi uh, uh, River. Um, and it's, it's also known for one of the, the, the longest uh, running radio um, uh, stations, the, the Biscuit or something like that. But it has a, a blues um, uh, heritage there, and they have a, a blues festival there every year. Uh, it was a thriving place when I grew up, and it is not so thriving now as a lot of other uh, places in, in the Delta and, and, and in Arkansas at large. But, but the blue uh, speaks to the, the blues that, that um, Helena, Arkansas is, is known for, the different acts that, that come through there. And, and may in, in some way um, uh, speak to the blues of the, the current existence of that, that small town. It, it was a place to visit when I was a little kid, you know, that, that brought a certain level of excitement of going to Helena. But today, it, it's, it's really dep depressing to see um, um, uh, the state of it today. So I'm going to go through the other slides just quickly um, and then turn the floor, open the floor so we can have questions. So this is just another um, image of the work. Oh, the next, well, yeah. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh oh, Alex. Out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay, how do we get rid of 
it'll, it'll go away. Just wait. Okay. Yeah. So this is the boy from Coffee Creek. And in me of the dreamer. So I wanted just to, if you could just speak briefly to who Joseph is, uh, because I thought that that was a really interesting story. Okay. This this piece is is up. I'm, I'm always um, I'm, I'm influenced by a, a lot of um, uh, visual art practices. Um, one of them is, is illustration and, and, and design, and I, I wanted to explore the the, the um, aspects of, of of patterns in this. This piece was was created uh, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I had the the end vision of this piece of mind, and I was able to go directly uh, to it. Um, and because of the, the patterns and the color and, and the body of it, um, I, I am using that to, to speak to the, the biblical story of, of Joseph, who, who was, who was um, envied by, by his brothers, you know, and, and sold into slavery. And, and this, and Joseph had was given a coat by, by his father, a coat of many coats. You know, so that, that kind of speaks to, to uh, that story. And visualizing um, Joseph as, as, as potentially a, a brown-skinned person, uh, which, which is, is, a, is an idea to, to consider. You know, whether whether how brown or, or how white or, or how olive he was, you know, I'm presenting him, you know, in this fashion. Um, Alex, mm -hmm. are there any questions? How are we doing on time? Your. What time is it? Oh. <laughs> 624. 624, okay, so we're going to open it up. Oh, we have one question. Um, Hi, I, wait, hold on. Oh, talking about it. Hi, and enjoyed your comments. I, I was thinking about the fabric that you use and how you go out to many uh, commercial fabric stores. Do you ever go to, like, the Salvation Army or any, you know, vintage or flea markets to get fabric that might have been worn and then use them in your works? That, that is something that uh, I've thought about and, and it does intrigue me. Um, one, one of the things I, I, I like, like to do is, is create work um, and let it evolve over, over time. That's, that's why I, I work on several pieces at the same time. And, and because of the, 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 the time limit, um, you know, um, trying to produce a work within a certain, certain amount of time, I didn't have the luxury to, to just fully explore um, uh, those, those possibilities. But that's something I've, I've thought about and, and even using um, some of the, reclaiming some of the, the fabric that, that I have personally. And, and talking with, with uh, my nephew, with, um, which my oldest sister is an avid uh, quilter that has a, a, a catalog of, of over, production of over 300 quilts that, that she has done over the years. She's uh, exactly 25 years my senior. And we've talked about a collaboration uh, with, with her. And she's, she's used reclaimed uh, materials. So, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that, that I've thought about. And, and this, as, as Profile of Colors has been, it is an a evolving um, uh, exploration of, of not just imagery, but, but material. Uh, but that was 
was also talking to this gentleman earlier. This is your husband, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this focus on portraiture. And lots of people are focusing on portraiture. I, mean, I think it's great. And, and to see the different uh, inspirations and the different renderings of the videos. So, yeah. I, I would say that, that yes, um, some has. has um, made reference to, to Candy Wyden um, with, with some of my work. Um, and r really, in, in the, the beginning, I, 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 I fell in love with, with using foliage, um, um, more, more leaf work, um, similar to, to what you, you would find, you would see in the uh, paintings of the horses, and, and using Using um, flowers, um, you know, a little less frequent, you know, but but I, I, I like like using that, that that foliage to 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 place my, my subjects subjects in the the more more use of the incorporation of the flowers became when I start uh, looking at fabric. Choosing, choosing them, but but my my painting will will probably have a, a lot of greenery uh, um, foliage in it with with uh, flowers here and there uh, for certain purposes. have been selected to appear in a movie. Um, they will be the works of, there's so many characters, but I think I have this right. So the, the title of the movie is Really Love, and uh, Lawrence Fishburne is playing the mentor to, sorry? Was. He was. Who, who's going to be the mentor? Michael, Michael Ely. Michael Ely is now the mentor. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and Michael Ely will be the person in the movie who created um, Ronald's work. Kofi, is Kofi still in the movie? Yes. Okay, Kofi, <laughs> whose last name I can't remember, he stars in Queen Sugar. He's going to be the young artist. And uh, Gerald, whose last name I do not know, he's an uh, artist from Atlanta, he's creating the work for that. Um, Uzu, Uzio, the woman orange is the new black, she's the gallerist. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> so it was exciting, we got to walk on the set the other day. It's being filmed here in Baltimore, in the Baltimore Sun building. Various locations between, you know, they, it's between DC and Baltimore where their film is being shot. So um, we're really excited about that. So many wonderful things are happening around Ronald's work. Um, some other announcements as we close. Um, September 15th, um, this is our fall exhibition calendar. We're uh, featuring the works of Afri-Cobra. And the title of the exhibition is Afri-Cobra, the Evolution of a Movement. And that is going to be followed by uh, a solo exhibition for Delita Martin between spirits and sisters. And that opens November 10th. So we want to thank you again for coming out and supporting uh, Ronald today. It's a fantastic talk. Thank you. Very informative. And um, invite you to come up and pose any questions you may have been too shy to ask in the group setting. And enjoy the food and the rest of the afternoon with us. Thank you.